Right, local anaesthesia. Well, as you all know, we have annotations on the HCPC register for those who can administer uh, the following prescription only medicines. Now these have changed over the years because I can certainly remember the time when we couldn't, for example, have adrenaline. Um, then methylprednisolone, our steroid has been added, and so on and so forth. It's worth making the point, I think, that we only have the annotation whilst we're currently on the register. So, for example, if I got struck off tonight, which I sincerely hope won't happen, um, then my medicine's entitlements would stop immediately because the register is run in real time. So that's something to be aware of with all of the annotations that we have. So for example, I'm an independent prescriber and a supplementary prescriber as well, but I only enjoy those annotations whilst I'm actually so annotated on the register. So if we look at the anesthetics that we've got, we've got the pivocaine. Now some of these are with adrenaline and I'll talk a little more about adrenaline a little later in the presentation because there are different viewpoints on it and it's worth perhaps considering them. Then lignocaine, also called lidocaine, also called xylocaine at one time. Then mepivacaine, our good old scandinest that we have. Prilocaine, another mepivacaine hydrochloride and ropivacaine hydrochloride. And then of course, as I said earlier, we've got adrenaline and we've also got methylprednisolone injection on this annotation as well. A question that we're certainly often asked um, at head office at the Institute is, well, if I'm annotated to have methylprednisolone steroid, can I use it without going on a training course? Because to the best of my knowledge, there are not many universities when they do the undergraduate degree that actually teach steroids. Uh, and that's a bit of a, it's a bit of a strange area because if you look at our conditions of practice, um, then really we should only be doing things that we are experienced within. And if you don't have experience within steroids, then it's quite a, it's quite a complex field with a lot of mind traps, a lot of minefields in it. And if you don't have that, then you could say the question, well, should you be using it if you haven't had the training course? Probably no, to be on the safe side. Might be an idea to establish a few terminologies before we start. Those of you who are chemists and other scientists will know this better than I do. But for the rest of us, including me who aren't chemists, then we'll just run through them briefly. WV that you'll often see is an abbreviation for weight by volume. And we'll use that to describe the concentration of a substance in a mixture or a solution. So the the weight by volume is the mass, usually expressed in grams, of the substance dissolved in or mixed with 100 milliliters of a solvent. So, for example, a 1% weight in volume saline has 1 gram of sodium chloride dissolved in 100 ml of water. Uh, weight in weight is another thing that you'll come across, and that's used in chemistry and pharmacology as well to describe the concentration of a substance in a mixture or a solution. So properly speaking, 2% um, weight in weight means that the mass of the substance is 2% of the total mass of the solution or the mixture. Uh, the metric symbol uh, gram in gram has the same meaning as the weight in weight. And I suppose, theoretically, pound in pound could be the same thing, although I've never heard that expressed. Somebody, I suppose, at the end of this procedure is going to uh, send me an email saying, yes, I've heard pound in pound. Well, if you have, please let me know. I'd be very interested to hear. When we're using local anaesthetics, as with any injectable medicine, well, as with any medicine in, in, in total, um, we do need to consider maximum safe dosage. And when we're considering that, if we look at how we work out the maximum safe dosage, then as a general rule, one mil of a 1% local anaesthetic solution contains 10 milligrams of that anaesthetic agent. 
So if we take our mepivacaine hydrochloride, our scandinest cartridges, that most of us tend to use as a, as a dental cartridge, um, the 2.2 mil cartridge of 3% weight in volume plane contains 10, uh, then in brackets, 2.2 mil times three for the 3% milligrams of agent. So for example, in that one cartridge, you got 66 milligrams of mepivacaine hydrochloride. Equally, if it's a different drug um, and the percentage is different, if you had lidocaine hydrochloride, which as I say is formerly called lignocaine and, as it, and has been called xylocaine in the past as well, then a 0.5% weight in volume solution would contain five milligrams of agent per mil, per one mil of the solution. So therefore a 10 milliampule would contain 10. Once again, in brackets, we work out the number 10 times 0 0.5. So you'd actually have 50 milligrams of lidocaine in it. Um, just in passing, you may often not have come across 0.5% lidocaine, but certainly when I was doing my skin surgery training um, with a consultant dermatologist, uh, she invariably used that for skin surgery um, because you can, with minor skin procedures, you can actually get a very big bleb under a lesion that you want to remove, however you're going to remove it, whichever surgical procedure you're going to use to remove it. Uh, you can use a lot of anesthetic to make a cushion under it. Uh, so 0.5% lidocaine can actually be quite useful. The only downside is that many presentations of it do have to be fridged. So you don't, uh, it's not recommended really to take it straight out of the fridge and inject it into the patient because I've seen that done a couple of times and uh, it does sting quite a bit. In the same way that if any of you have ever had a cold blood transfusion, that's the same thing as well. So that's our maximum safe dosage. What we then need to look at is various groups of anesthetics because anesthetics, local anesthetics, will fall into, into two, two groups essentially. One group is an amide, and the other group is an ester. And if you look at the actual structure of the local anesthetic from a chemical point of view, uh, you've got a lipid soluble hydrophobic aromatic group. So that group doesn't like <coughs> that because it's hydrophobic. So it doesn't like water and a charged hydrophilic amide group that does like water. And the bond between these two groups determines the class of the drug, which can be, as I've said, either an amide or an ester. Examples of amides that we'll be familiar with do include lignocaine, also bupivacaine, that any of you who are podiatric surgeons will probably be very familiar with, uh, and prilocaine, that can be quite a useful anesthetic as well. Examples of esters, which tend to be the older drugs, include cocaine and amethocaine and tetracaine. Now, when you compare these two groups, as I mentioned, anesthetics, local anesthetics contain a linkage, then the linkage in an ester is more easily broken than the linkage, than the bond in an amide anesthetic. Now that's particularly when you apply heat to it. So ester drugs are intrinsically less stable in solution and they can't be stored for as long as amides. Uh, amide anesthetics, on the other hand, are relatively heat stable, so they can therefore be autoclaved and sterilized effectively, whereas esters can't. That's not to say that esters aren't sterilized, but they can't be sterilized by, um, by heat, essentially. Also, the metabolism of most esters results in the production of PABA, which is para-aminobenzoate. Now, this is a substance, it's a, it's a metabolite that's associated with an allergic reaction. So, once again, if you look at the literature, you tend to see that a lot of the reports of allergic reactions, certainly in the past, were with the older esters. Amides, in contrast, they very rarely 
cause allergic reactions. Uh, and for those reasons, amides are now far, far more commonly used than esters. There are exceptions to that, as there always will be, but in the main, um, amides are the agents of choice nowadays. We also need, need perhaps to consider the potency of uh, local anesthetics and how that potency is expressed. Now, potency is demonstrated by the lipid solubility of the agent described as the lipid against water partition coefficient, LWPC, which is easier to say. And that expresses the ratio, the amount of the agent in each phase of the substance. High coefficients, so high, high coefficient values increase lipophilic properties. And that therefore allows for the substance to more easily go into the cell membrane. So therefore it becomes a more potent substance. And if we look at how that compares with a list, then here's the potency comparisons. So papivacaine has a potency comparison of eight. Uh, lignocaine, mepivacaine and prilocaine are exactly the same, with a potency comparison of two. And rapivacaine sits between the two. So that comes in at, at four instead of eight. All of those are on your local anaesthetic exemptions, your local anaesthetic exemptions to the Medicines Act. So they're all quite useful to, to be aware of those different comparisons of it. Very often you can usefully utilize two different anaesthetics in the same procedure. So for example, let's suppose you're doing simple nail surgery, PNA, TNA, whatever, then obviously you want to get the toe frozen as quickly as you can. So one of the fast acting anesthetics like uh, mepivacaine and like lignocaine uh, can be used, usually mepivacaine for convenience. Um, and then that will give you fairly rapid anesthesia. And then if you want to prolong the duration of the anesthesia, you can use bupivacaine, um, either during the procedure or indeed after the procedure, if you want to give a bit of decent pain control uh, afterwards before they go home. And once they go home, they can then start to take other painkillers. But it can be a little bit of a, a little bit of a help to your patients by just doing that, just extending the use of anesthetics that you do. Because what I've noticed over the years is we perhaps in podiatry don't utilize anesthetics to the extent that we could uh, for some of the most simple things because okay we can use local anesthetics for procedures that we want to do but equally of course um, we can use them for diagnostic purposes because if you want to uh, if you want to check where you whether you've found the right source of the pain for example perhaps you're looking at things like trigger points um, then local anaesthetics, a bit of local anaesthetic popped into a trigger point, can prove or disprove the fact that that is the trigger point. Especially if it's a distant trigger point, you can use that quite usefully. And very often that's something we don't seem to do. Right, we'll now go through a list of anaesthetics by name and by features. Um, so, in no particular order this, by the way, it doesn't have any significance. It's just the way that I wrote the PowerPoint. So lidocaine, um, also known as lignocaine, also known as xylocaine. You can get that as a plain solution for injection, actually ranging from 0.5% weight in volume to 2% weight in volume in many sizes. So it can come from a one mil ampule size, it can be a two mil, a five mil, a 10 mil, I've certainly come across. Um, it's also available with adrenaline. Now, adrenaline, we'll look at that perhaps in a little more detail a little later in the presentation. Um, but the perception in podiatry is usually that uh, we, don't use podi we don't use adrenaline in toes. And once again, we'll perhaps talk about that a little bit later on. But certainly if you're doing skin surgery of any kind, if you're doing the odd lump and bump, then adrenaline can be very useful indeed because uh, it can give you a bloodless or a relatively bloodless field. And uh, that helps to actually see what you're doing. 
uh, saves you reaching for the high fricator all the time to pinch a little errant blood vessel. So adrenaline can be a great help there. The summary of product characteristics, and I always stumble at saying that for some strange reason. The summary of product characteristics, which is the licensed application of the drug, uh, says that this may be used to produce a local numbness. Well, that's a bit of a no-brainer. By injection of the solution into or around the area of operation. And it also refers to the fact that you can use it for nerve blocks, nerve blockade, or equally, and probably not very interesting to us as podiatrists, it can be injected into the epidural space. Now, as far as I'm aware, nobody's doing epidurals for nail surgery yet. That's probably a, a bit of a, a bridge too far at the moment. Um, but it can also be used for that very interesting procedure called a Beers block. Now, once again, Beers blocks tend to be used on arms, although I suppose they can be used on legs as well. And that is where you actually use the, the venous system as the conduction route of your local anaesthetic. And uh, a Beers block uh, means that you have a tourniquet on the arm. And then once the blood has been extravasated from the arm, you, you fill the thing up with local anaesthetic. And then the local anaesthetic permeates down through the veins, permeates into the surrounding tissues. And of course, as we know, nerves tend to run by blood vessels. And that's how you anaesthetize it using a Beers block. Um, I've seen it done once in hospital. But as I say, in podiatry, perhaps its use is more uh, academic than, uh, than critical. Um, lidocaine is, is an old drug, quite an old drug. It's got a long history. It is an amide, so it comes within what we think of as the more modern group of drugs. The maximum safe dosage in the United Kingdom is three milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Interestingly, in the USA, it's four milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Uh, not to exceed 280 milligrams at any one time. It's quite fast acting, um, especially on mucous membranes as well. So it'll act uh, in about 30 seconds with infiltration. It does have various interactions that you need to be aware of from the summary of product characteristics. Um, so for example, it can interact with beta blockers. So timolol, propanolol, some calcium channel blockers that people might be on, a verapamil, some medicines used in the treatment of stomach ulcers. So for example, ranitidine and cimetidine. Now, in recent years, of course, um, cimetidine, Tagamet, has become available over the counter. And sometimes when we ask our patients, are you taking any medicines? They only tend to think of medicines that are uh, prescribed for them, not something that they've just walked into a pharmacy and bought. So um, it's obviously worthwhile taking a very, very, very good history indeed, which of course we all do. Um, but just be aware of the fact that some of the medicines they're taking that they might have bought without being prescribed for them can actually have um, an effect. It can have an interaction with it. Um, strong pain-killing medicines such as codeine, uh, for example, which can be bought in certain <clears throat> excuse me, which can be bought in certain uh, presentations and concentrations over the counter can also react. And then uh, medicines that they use to treat certain types of muscle jerking, so serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine can also have an interaction. So there's quite a few potential interactions. The majority of them, it's fair to say, are probably not life-threatening, but some of them can be very in inconvenient and some of them, of course, can be life-threatening. If we come on to our, possibly our favourite in podiatry, uh, good old Scandinavian, also known as carbocaine. And that's available as a plain solution in self-aspirating cartridges, which I would imagine is what most of us use. 3% uh, weight in volume and also 2% weight in volume with adrenaline. Um, once again, the adrenaline version can possibly be useful for skin surgery in similar applications like that. It's licensed applications, um, they're quite brief actually. It's a relief of pain in dental procedures, but interestingly, for dental procedures, it's adults and children over the three years of age. And as they quaintly call them still, in the summary of product characteristics, chiropathy procedures, but in adults only. So 
technically, if you use it on uh, young Jimmy, 13 year old young Jimmy's ingrown toenail, then you are technically using it outside its license. Or, uh, which I've never ever heard being a problem for people, but you do need to be aware of it because there is a possibility that you could be criticized for using it outside of license. Um, the obvious solution to it is if you're ever concerned about, then use something that doesn't have this little bit uh, of addition to its SPC, something like lidocaine, which has a similar, a similar schedule to good old Mepivacaine. Um, the Mepivacaine was developed in 1957, so it was actually, uh, to me, relatively modern because I was born before 1957. Uh, it is an amide. It's United Kingdom maximum safe dose is uh, six milligrams or 6.6 .6 milligrams in the USA per kilogram of body weight. It's fast acting around about two minutes or possibly even less. And as I've just shown you in the previous slide, it's summary of product characteristics are quite short on detail, but uh, it contains what we need. Bupivacaine, also known as Marcaine. Now this is as you saw from the earlier slide, this is the longest acting of all the anesthetics. And also um, it can be sometimes the slowest acting as well, because probably many of us have sat by the side of the patient or popped the patient in the room next door when we're perhaps doing an ankle block or even if we're just doing a simple tibial block and we do the block and then five minutes later, it hasn't kicked in. 10 minutes later, it hasn't kicked in. And then sometimes you get to about 20 minutes and then it might just slowly kick in if you haven't got it just in the right spot. But then again, of course, it does have the, the benefit that it's going to last for a long time. Um, it's available as a plain solution, 0.1% to 0.5% weight in volume. And you can also get a 0.25% and a 0.5% weight in volume with adrenaline. Um, its presentation, well, the only presentation that I come across personally is in polyamps, which I think is a 10 mil polyamp. Um, there may be other presentations out there. If there are, I've never personally come across them. Um, its UK licensed application uh, is includes obstetric operations and caesarean sections, which once again, we're probably not very interested in. Uh, but undefined acute pain relief, including labor or post-operative pain, diagnosis and treatment of chronic pain. And that is probably one of the few references to using uh, local anesthetic as a diagnostic tool, even though certainly back in the 1930s, uh, there was a couple of French physicians, Lariche was one, uh, and they were using it as a diagnostic, as a diagnostic tool uh, in spinal conditions to identify which particular spinal root nerve was um, was giving the pain, was giving rise to the pain. Um, but as I say, once again, in podiatry, we, we don't seem to do that to a great extent. But the pivocaine can be used for a variety of things. You can use it as local infiltration, and nerve blocks, and as I said, epidurals, which we are not really interested in to a great extent. It is an amide. It's UK maximum safe dose is uh, two milligrams per kilogram of body weight. In the USA, it's two and a half milligrams, not to exceed 400 milligrams in 24 hours. Um, are you listening out there, podiatric surgeons? Uh, long duration of action, it's got six hours plus, but uh, it's got a slow onset. It can be mixed with short acting esters, but results vary. And just a word on mixing. Um, technically, if you mix two medicines, then you are creating a new medicine. Now, many of you will be utilizing these under the exemption to the Medicines Act that is your annotation. So annotations do not permit mixing, technically speaking. If you're an independent prescriber or if you're a supplementary prescriber, then you specifically can mix medicines provided they're licensed medicines. 
unlicensed medicines are a completely different ball game and a, and a whole minefield. But technically speaking, you shouldn't mix the two anesthetics. Um, that's probably all I should say on that subject. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody ever having been hauled over coals for doing it, but we probably need to be aware of it. Um, it is said, perhaps with justification, uh, that it is said to be the most cardiotoxic of all of the local anaesthetics, certainly all of the local anaesthetics that we use. Now, once again, in a later slide, we will actually look at that statement and see how that can be backed up because podiatry, as in many other areas of medicine, um, there's lots of anecdotes floating about, but when you actually try and pin down the anecdote and say, well, where did it happen? Who did it happen to? How did it happen? Why did it happen? And when did it happen? Then sometimes it's not so easy to find the answer, but we'll look at that in a little more detail a little later. Prilocaine, otherwise known as Cytonest, once again is available as a plain 1% solution in multi-dose glass vials of 20 and 50 mil. It's available as a 4% plain solution in dental cartridges and it's available as a 3% solution with octopressin. Now octopressin is a, is a, a synthetic uh, vasopressin analogue so that would really be same, performing the same function as adrenaline would. So it would cause the, the contraction of mind blood vessels, especially if you were doing skin surgery, for example. Its UK licensed applications are as a local anaesthetic for use in infiltration anaesthesia and nerve blocks, and the maximum dose in adults should be 400 milligrams. Once again, relatively new drug. Uh, developed in 1959, it is an amide. Uh, those are the maximum safe dosage that you can see on the screen, five milligrams per kilogram in children greater than six months, seven milligram per kilogram USA, but see the product license because it is quite a detailed product license. It is slower than lidocaine, or mepivacaine come to that, but uh, faster than mepivacaine. It does have various interactions, uh, in particular drugs which may predispose to uh, methemoglobin formation. Um, so sulfonamides, antimalarials, and certain nitric compounds, they could potentiate the adverse effect of prilocaine. And we'll look at its potential adverse effect a little later in this presentation. Levobopivacaine, otherwise known by its alternative name as chirocaine, that's available as a 0.25% or 0.75% plain solution in 10 mil ampoules. And you can also get a 0.125% and 0.0625% weight in volume plain solutions as epidural infusion bags containing 100 mil and 200 mil. Um, I really can't see the point of um, infusion bags for us in podiatry because I can't really picture keeping a great big bag in your medicines fridge and then just taking a little bit out now and again to do it. I don't think. Uh, I don't think the HPC would, HCPC would see that as quite responsible conduct and quite rightly too. Its licensed applications in the UK are surgical anaesthesia, including epidurals, uh, peribulbar, around the eyes and infiltration, and management of unspecified acute pain. Developed in 1996, so it's a very, very recent drug as drugs go, it is of course an amide. It is an isomer of bupivacaine, so it's related to bupivacaine in as much as it has the same number and the same types of atoms, but it possesses slightly different properties. It is reported to be less cardiotoxic. So that could possibly be a reason to examine you know, the feasibility for its use. Uh, its UK maximum safe dosage is two milligrams per kilogram of body weight, two and a half milligrams in the USA. Maximum dose in 24 hours should be 400 milligrams. Does have a similar speed of action to the pivacaine. And once again, uh, if you look up on the internet, you can see the whole summary of product characteristics, uh, which is fairly de detailed. Then we have ropivacaine, otherwise known as a narrow pin. 
Uh, I've never personally come across it as a narrow pin. Some of you may have. I'd be interested to hear if you actually have. But a rapivacaine, certainly. And it's available as those um, laid out there, 0.2%, 0.75% or 1% plain solution in polyamps for injection and also available in poly bags, the 0.25% weight in volume plain solution as well. Its licensed applications are all types of surgical anesthesia essentially, including epidurals, nerves and field block, and also acute pain management, including these continuous infusions that they have, um, field blocks, um, intermittent bolus injections, etc. So a very wide range of product characteristics in its license there. It was developed in 95, so it is an amide. Um, it's UK maximum safe dosage for a major nerve block, say for example a brachial plexus, which we wouldn't really get into. Adult and child over 12 years, 30 to 40 mil, 225 to 300 milligrams of 7.5 milligram solution. Field block there, you've got the figures. For acute pain, using a two milligram per mil solution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's got a wide range there that's worth consulting if it's something that you, uh, you do decide to use. Now, potential problems. Well, all medicines can have problems. I know when I was doing my independent prescribing course, uh, our pharmacologist said the medicine that doesn't have interactions is the medicine that doesn't work. Um, obviously, we're only really interested in interactions that can be harmful to our patients. But of course, local anesthetics can be intrinsically harmful because depending on the amount and depending on the patient as well. So they can be toxic if sufficient amounts are absorbed into the systemic circulation. As I said earlier, the pivocaine does seem to be the most dangerous, although all of them can be harmful. Clinical toxicity appears to relate to the effects of the drug on any other excitable membranes in the body. So for example, you've got the central nervous system, the cardiovascular system. Central nervous system effects can uh, include tingling of the lips, we're told, slurred speech, a reduced level of consciousness, and also seizures. Now, Classically, if it is a cardio, cardiovascular system toxicity, that can happen in three phases. The initial phase uh, tends to include hypertension and tachycardia. So you've got a spike in blood pressure, you've got a raise in blood pressure, and then you've got a rapid heartbeat. Then you can go into an intermediate phase, and that's where there's myocardial depression. So the actual output of the heart reduces, and you get hypotension. So the blood pressure has dropped. So first of all, it spikes and then it drops. Then there's a terminal phase that we hope people don't reach, which can include peripheral vasodilation, probably similar to what you would see in anaphylaxis, severe hypotension and a variety of arrhythmias, such as sinus bradycardia, so very slow, very slow heartbeat, a conduction block actually in the heart itself, so it can interfere with the ability of the heart to contract and then ventricular tachyarrhythmia, so very fast quivering of the ventricles in a disordered way, and ultimately, hopefully not, asystole, flatlining and death. So that's obviously something that we want to avoid if we possibly can. Um, also, you can have um, unexpected toxicity where the, the drug, the makeup, of the pharmacological makeup of the drug itself are altered either by comorbidity in the patient or a reaction with another drug. Something can happen in the patient where the plasma protein binding uh, is affected. But the other clinical problems of interactions do tend to be specific to particular drugs. So for example, the drug prilocaine is uh, metabolized to O-toluidine, which can cause methemoglobinemia in susceptible individuals. Now, as we all know, methemoglobinemia uh, is a condition in which the hemoglobin in blood is in the oxidized or the ferric state. So essentially, 
it loses its ability to reversibly bind to oxygen. Now, of course, if you lose that reversible binding in your bloodstream, it can't effectively transport oxygen. So that, of course, can lead to low blood, um, low blood oxygen and general systemic hypoxia. And if that persists to a great extent, then, of course, if there's no oxygen going around, oxygenating the body, then you die. Primarily, that's been reported with prilocaine, but to a certain extent with lidocaine as well, although with the lidocaine, it tended to be most of the reports came from procedures that were taking place in the upper gastrointestinal tract, and possibly it was through excessive mucous membrane absorption, because lidocaine, as with other local anaesthetics, can be absorbed very rapidly through mucous membranes. You only have to see it when your dentist puts a little spot of anaesthetic where, hopefully, he puts a little spot of anaesthetic where he's going to inject uh, your gum um, to take your tooth out or to fill your tooth. So that can happen very, very rapidly. The same way it can happen with the eyes, for example. That can absorb it very, very rapidly from its surface. Um, but prilocaine especially, um, if we come back to that, most of you will be familiar with Emla the eutectic mixture of local anaesthetic creams. Now that contains lidocaine and prilocaine. So if that was to be used in large amounts, then if patients had congenital or idiopathic, no known cause, met hemoglobinemia, then that could be a problem. Now, if we look at action in emergencies, which hopefully will not happen if we've done our job properly, um, the following page I've taken it with kind permission from the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland. Now this, bear in mind, is a hospital-based protocol. So very often those of us who are working in primary care, some of this won't, can't be applicable to us unless you've got, you know, the, um, the primary care practice to, to die for and have your own emergency team tucked away in your cupboard somewhere. But I show it just out of interest, and then perhaps we can look in slightly more detail at things that we can do in our own practices. Of course, your practice may be in hospital, as is mine on some occasions, uh, in which case you can you know, simply uh, press the button on the wall and you have this wonderful team come and take over. But very often it will just be us and perhaps our assistant doing it. So that's why it might be an idea to look at it in slightly more detail. Um, you're strongly recommended yourself in your own practices, obviously, to take a risk analysis, a very detailed risk analysis. Um, look at your emergency planning, look at staff training as and when necessary, work out how you'd actually deal with an emergency action. But coming back to the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland, this is their protocol. Uh, some of it, of course, is very relevant to what we do. First of all, stop injecting the local anaesthetic. Well, it's a bit of a no-brainer. So, you know, if the patient uh, starts to go woozy while we're doing it, then yeah, stop it. Call for help. It's another good thing to know as well. And inform the immediate clinical team of a problem. You might not have an immediate clinical team, but once again, um, you might, for all I know. Uh, they call for a cardiac arrest trolley and a lipid rescue pack. And more on lipid rescue packs in a moment. Um, also, they say you should give 100% oxygen and ensure adequate lung ventilation. They talk about um, securing the airway with a tracheal tube and things like that. Once again, probably not something that you would do in primary care, but there are airways that you can certainly use in primary care. And we'll look at those in a little bit. Um, hyperventilation, overventilation may actually help to reduce the acidosis that is associated with uh, toxicity. Um, once again, they would establish an intravenous access. Um, if there is circulatory arrest, this is something we would also do. We'd start continuous CPR using standard CPR protocols, 30 to 2, 30 to 2, 30 to 2. Um, they would give intravenous lipid emulsion, more of that later, bearing in mind that recovery could take more than an hour. Uh, they would also consider things that we probably wouldn't consider, cardiopulmonary bypasses, etc uh, etc et and they would also perhaps look to control seizures with incremental doses of benzodiazepine valium 
uh, thiopental or propofol. Once again, probably the, the only thing that any of us, even if we were local anesthetics, would have on hand of those would be benzodiazepine, and that, that would be in the oral form, it wouldn't be in the injectable form. But there's a few little pearls we can take out of that. Um, on intralipid, this is quite a fascinating subject. Um, it sounds as though it's been brewed in a kitchen. And maybe when you look at the, uh, the recipe of it, perhaps it, it, it has been because it contains soybean, soybean oil, egg phospholipids, glycerin and water. Um, so it's quite oily, unctuous stuff and it comes in bags obviously because you have to introduce it through a port into the body or squeeze it into the body because it doesn't really flow that easily. Um, interestingly enough, I did ask the minor uh, injuries unit at our local hospital here in the Midlands whether they actually had intralipid and they said intra what? So I assumed by that that they didn't. Obviously an emergency department of a major hospital would have it, I would certainly hope. Um, but the mechanism by which it works uh, is not fully agreed on, even though this stuff has been around for years and it is used for other things in medicine as well, in obstetrics, for example. Uh, the mechanism by which it is supposed to reverse local anaesthetic cardiotoxicity uh, is to increase the clearance of the local anaesthetics from the heart tissue. Now, that's turned a lipid sink, so it's becoming a lipid sink, so it scavenges the the local anaesthetic out of the heart tissue because essentially that's probably what's being affected by the toxic reaction. Uh, another mechanism that's proposed is that lipids counteract the local anaesthetic inhibition of the myocardial fatty acid oxidation. Therefore that increases the potential for energy production and it reverses the cardiac depression that is one of the features of the more advanced stages of toxicity. Whichever way it does actually work, it certainly is regarded as a standard in secondary care medicine. Um, obviously, you're all experienced practitioners. It's not my role, nor should I say you must do this and you must do that. Um, these are just a few suggestions that you might want to consider. Um, there are certainly things that I consider before I stick a needle in somebody and administer a drug. First of all, I ensure that the patient is appropriate for local anaesthetic and the way to do that is to take a history, take a history and take a history. And we've all been there when we're taking a history of the patient and you say, what, uh, what medicines do you take Mrs. Smith? And Mrs. Smith says, well dear, I take a red tablet and I take a pink tablet. What are they for Mrs. Smith? Oh, I don't know, the doctor gave, me to, gave them to me about 20 years ago and I'm still taking them. So it can be a bit of a challenge taking a decent history, but it's a good idea to do it as well as you possibly can. Naturally, of course, we also need informed consent from the patient. We then need to ensure that the anaesthetic that we propose to use is suitable for that particular patient with any comorbidities that that patient might have. For example, methemoglobinemia and prilocaine. That would be a contraindication. It's also a good idea as well to use the lowest dose possible for effect and that's where some of the lower strengths can be useful. I mean certainly when I was doing my skin surgery training with, uh, with the dermatologist that I studied with, uh, Liz Todd, wonderful dermatologist, she just retired and uh, now she does some work for the Institute so we haven't lost touch which is very good. But she always used the lowest possible concentration that she could use for skin surgery. Now bear in mind this is somebody who's been doing skin surgery for 30 years and her skin surgery is the kind of skin surgery that we wouldn't get involved with. So we're talking about wide local excisions and malignant skin cancers, uh, wide local excisions and non-malignant skin cancers and other, other things there. And if she was taking something out even by an ellipse excision then she'd put really big cushion of the lowest concentration of anaesthetic that she could underneath that lesion to raise it up, to give anaesthesia, but also, also to separate the tissue planes, which can be quite useful if you're doing skin surgery. So low dose can be good 
or low dose anesthetic can be good for a variety of reasons. They recommend anecdotally that adrenaline shouldn't be used for digits. Now I've been told this, you've probably been told this over the years. Am I recommending that you should use it? No, I'm not because I don't have that knowledge to know whether it's safe or not. And interestingly enough, if you look at the Cochrane collaboration, then you'll see that neither do they. So they did do a research project uh, on the 19th of March, 2015, and they actually only found four studies so that, that referred to the problems or not problems of using local anesthetics in digits, be that fingers or be that toes. And they concluded with all the, um, all the experience that they have of, of looking at research like this, they concluded that from the limited data available, evidence is insufficient to recommend the use or avoidance of adrenaline in digital nerve box. As I say, they, they could only find four studies. There was no reported ischemia in the ones that they looked at, so there was, there was no instances where there seemed to be an occlusion of the blood vessels, um, but there was um, reduced bleeding, naturally, as you would expect, <coughs> reported into the studies. Now, as I said earlier, reduced bleeding for skin surgery can be useful. Stops you reaching for the hypergator and cooking blood vessels. It's a good idea as well, perhaps, to be prepared for cardiopulmonary resuscitation and anaphylaxis. Um, our CPR skills, if we don't use them, do tend to atrophy a little bit. So it can be useful to uh, make sure that you keep those skills up to date. And uh, you know, Remember that it is 30 to 2, 30 to 2, 30 to 2, provided, of course, that you're willing to give resuscitation breaths, which I would be very surprised anybody to be willing to do in this current COVID climate. And on the back of that, that's why I personally, in my resuscitation kit, I always keep a BVM, a bag valve mask, which is, as you know, you've got the, 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 big, the big balloon made of plastic that you can compress and there's a mask that then goes over your face and by compressing that, you can actually ventilate the lungs. Um, they're easy and cheap to get hold of. Uh, they can be a single use version. So there's no, uh, there's no problems with cross contamination and things like that. Um, a little bit of training in how to use them can be quite useful because for example, you shouldn't really use the bag to inflate more than eight times a minute. Well, there's a possibility that you will overload the normal expiration and it will start to inflate a person's stomach. Now, of course, if they've got a full stomach with stomach contents and then they actually have explosive regurgitation and then they aspirate the stomach contents and you probably killed them uh, even if they're in hospital. So uh, have a caution with using bag valve masks but use properly they can be jolly useful and of course they reduce any possibility of cross-contamination especially if that person has got COVID-19 or some other nasty disease. Um, when you're using a bag valve mask it can be quite handy to use an airway now, obviously, the blade airways that you see on uh, casualty and things like that, even in hospital, we are told that the only people who should do that is a consultant anesthetologist, and quite rightly so, because you can do terrible damage if you try and put a blade airway in. But the uh, oropharyngeal airways that some of you may have come across as the Gerdell airways, and if you haven't seen them, have a look on YouTube. There's some quite good stuff about them. They can be really useful to keep an airway open, very simple to insert. They can keep the airway open while you're using, for example, a BVM, rather more than having to keep moving the head up and down because the head goes down, blocks the airway off. Um, oxygen, should you keep oxygen? It's a good question, only you can answer that. Personally, in my case, yes, I, I do, and I think it's a good idea to do so. Uh, oxygen sets are quite cheap, so a set will cost you a couple of hundred pounds a year if you have a rental agreement from British Oxygen. That will include servicing of the kit and so on and so forth, and you just pay for, pay for fills. Um, you need a little bit of training to do it, but you can actually do the training online with British Oxygen, uh, and there's no charge for it. It isn't a prescription-only medicine, so you don't have any issues with that. Uh, it, it can be jolly useful stuff to to keep in your uh, in your armory so to speak uh, i've heard it said anecdotally that it's very good as well if you have a hangover 
but I wouldn't know anything about that, of course. Um, then, of course, adrenaline. Um, if somebody does have an anaphylactic reaction to local anaesthetics, which, as we found earlier, uh, with the amides, with the newer amides, is rare, very rare, we believe. Um, how do you keep it? Well, auto injectors for immediate use, so jolly useful, and very expensive, of course. Um, the dose of some of them is quite low. Um, because you'll see that some of them have a 300 microgram dosage, whereas if you go onto the UK Resuscitation Council website, you'll see that the recommended adult dose is 500 micrograms. Now, that's half a milligram. Uh, now, obviously, there are exceptions to that. I think there's one or two of the auto injectors now do have half a milligram of adrenaline in them, but some of them still do have 300 micrograms and technically that is that is lower than the recommended adult dose and another word on that as well if you look at the recommendations in the uk resuscitation council it says if there's no effect after five minutes give them another one if there's no effect after that give them another five, another one and so on and so forth and if, you, if you're just restricted to one auto injector or two auto injectors and you run out and the emergency services haven't turned out yet then that could be um embarrassing to say the least whereas if you keep ampules in as a second line backup as i do for example then it can be useful um, not perhaps for immediate use because i guarantee if you pick an ampule up and you break it nine times out of ten you actually cut your finger i know i've done it on a few occasions but it's useful perhaps to have an auto ejector for the first treatment and then ampules to back it up um, as with all adrenaline or epinephrine Adrenaline technically is a trade name, epinephrine is the chemical name of it. Um, it's usually quite um, late dated. So I've never really come across any of those that have much more than a, than a year or a year and a half in the maximum. And of course, don't delay <coughs> in summoning help. The most important thing you can do. Because it can be very lonely when you're they're dealing with something like that and time's running out or your resuscitated drugs are running out and uh, also you're getting tired with doing the CPR and all the rest of it. So make sure that you summon help first of all. So in conclusion, if I haven't bored you all to death, if I have bored you to death and my apologies, but if I haven't, as I used to say in uh, Hill Street Blues, let's be careful out there. And if you've got any comments or any questions, then please send an email in to secretary at iocp.org.uk with LA Web in the subject line. That will get to me or one of the team and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. So I would like to thank you all very, very much for taking the time to have a look at this. Um, as we do more of these, I hope we'll get better at it. Um, I can't see myself on screen, so I'm not sure whether you've actually been treated to the horror of seeing my face or just perhaps seeing my bristle-headed haircut. But I have to say I did myself uh, with great trepidation, but it was either go to the barber and rebreathe on or do it myself, so I did it myself. But anyway, thank you very much indeed, and uh, please check in next week. What we propose to do next week for the webinar is uh, skin cancers, which might be quite appropriate with all the sunshine that's coming in through my window. So thank you all and good night to you all and have a good night and please stay safe.